Hello viewers, welcome to your weekly State of Affairs program here on QTV, the Gambia's first private TV station. We are broadcasting from our studio here on Kairaba Avenue. My name is Aliu Sise and as usual I'm here this week also with uh, Mr. Mumudumbuch. It's more like a co-host and also a contributor. Mr. Mboch, yes. good to have you on the program again. Um, um, my, my, my pleasure to, to be here, you know, sitting in for CD. CD, CD. <laughs> Until he returns. <laughs> He's still away, but hopefully he will join us next week, God willing. Well, viewers, uh, this week uh, we are joined by a Gambian who actually traveled to the United States uh, several years ago to, to pursue his dreams, which is to study uh, political science among other fields. And he had also served as a as a professor at the Miami State University. Well, in, 20, in September 2014, uh, our guest was one of the four uh, Miami professors who received the Distinguished uh, Scholar Award, which is a recognition of his research on democracy and elections in Africa, the role of the, mili the, the, role of the military in politics, and human rights advocacy, especially for asylum seekers. Well, he had also appeared in the, in the last uh, TRC public hearings where he gave his perspective about the former regime and Gambian politics in general. This is nobody but Professor Abdullah Sen. Professor, good to have you on the program. Thank you, Aliyo. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Well, uh, during the program, we'll be looking at the, the legislature. I mean, we've seen that you know, we, we, we have now also in the sixth legislature. A cabinet has mm -hmm. just been sworn in. And of course, we look at the you know, politics in this, in this country. But just give us your own perspective looking at the sixth legislature. I mean, we know that there was nomination, election, campaign, and finally we have our sixth legislature. Well, I thank you for the opportunity. Because since I arrived about nine months ago, I made a deliberate decision not to be involved oh. politically. Yeah. So this is really a good opportunity for me to share some of my observations about the process. I think uh, the election process cycle went relatively well. And uh, I was pleased by the ease as well as the peace uh, within which everything was conducted. Um, the results were surprising, certainly. But nonetheless, it gives the president and his uh, party uh, a mandate to rule the country uh, along lines that they see most feasible. Um, I would have wanted the president, given his mandate, to have hit the ground running and give us an outline in the first 100 days as to what he would, like, he would like to accomplish. I think that was a major lull period, which I thought was time lost. Um, but here we are. The nominations have been made, and I believe the cabinet really is uh, it's a good cabinet on the whole. But there's concern that gender parity has been, has been uh, to some degree undermined. And I believe that to be the case. In fact, while there are good women in cabinet, I do believe the representation should have been higher. In fact, I do believe also that uh, there should have been perhaps more women in the cabinet than the men. Because we have qualified women. And for the most part, they've borne the brunt of much of the electioneering, the, you know, you name it and given their centrality in our society and their sensitivity among other things, uh, I would have liked to see more women. What I also like about the fact of having more women is to have women not in their traditional roles. There's nothing wrong in appointing a woman to take care of children and welfare or the environment or education. These are important very important uh, portfolios. But it tends to replicate uh, the, the traditional division of labor in our societies within the cabinet itself. Why not a woman for finance or defense and so forth and so on. So in that, in that sense, uh, I would have liked to see more women. Um, the division of the Secretary General, a new minister for I public, believe public service, public service yes, reforms and policy coordination is, is very nebulous. It's, 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 kind of, it's kind of blurry in terms of their function and responsibilities, but the expectation is over time 
these glitches potentially could be, could be ironed out. I mean, you talk about the, the composite of the cabinet, like you said, I mean, there was a sort of gender parity being undermined. I mean, let's now look at the legislature, another important arm of the yes. government. What's your take? I mean, there also we have seen women representation. It's not as many would have expected. Yes. I was, I was very disappointed with the representation, really. I would have thought that President Barry would have taken the opportunity to nominate into the National Assembly groups that have historically been underrepresented, uh, the differently disabled, Christians. I couldn't believe that there isn't a single Christian in the Gambia's National Assembly. I think that's something that must be corrected and corrected very quickly. The appointment of uh, Honorable Tombong Jata, Jata as the Speaker of the House. As the Speaker of the House. And Sidin Jai uh, is a slap in the face. How, Prof? It's a slap in the face that for those of us who have struggled against the APRC, AFPRC as well, for so many years, and given the roles that these gentlemen have played in the perpetuation of the Jaime uh, dictatorship, I would have thought that they would not occupy such important positions. Look, it is politics, and I can understand that. To me, Barrow is a political realist. Uh, he, I'm sure, gave some consideration to the fallout that might likely come out of this. But at the end of the day, his interests, his desire to stay in power were paramount vis-a-vis -vis those moral uh, considerations. Um, I am also quite disappointed with the fact that there are so few women in the National Assembly. Um, and I think really Baro should have taken this opportunity to represent more women. How can you uh, nominate uh, a candidate that had lost an election and being brought the back way? To me, that's just simply unacceptable. I'm not really sure what the reasoning is behind all this. Is it because he wants to perpetuate himself in power? Or is it because the National Assembly being a central institution would ultimately or potentially be turned into a rubber stamp National Assembly? It's too early to tell. But the signs, to say the least, are concerning. I mean, you mentioned the case of the, the Speaker of the Parliament here, Pabagatambung Jata and the Deputy Speaker, uh, Honorable Sidinja, who are both nominated by the President. You talk about how they help, uh, in your own words, perpetuate uh, the former regime. But I mean, one will argue, I mean, these two men were never summoned to any commission, not the TRC, not even the Jana Commission. So how do you substantiate your disclaim that they help perpetuate the former regime? Well, wasn't it Sidinja who was the last minister? Minister of Information. Of Information. Did he go to Equatorial Guinea and then came back later? Uh, Tombang Jada, during the election cycle, collaborated as well as held conversations with the former president. He is a central figure in the APRC. In fact, I think he was chairman at some point. Majority leader. Majority leader, yes. Parliament. Well, I mean, whether he was called or adversely mentioned or not, uh, makes him complicit in what happened before and after. I don't think one has to be adversely mentioned or be banned from politics for 10 years uh, and not be challenged in terms of their activity. So in my book, <laughs> ultimately I think Tambak Jara is as responsible as Sidin Jai in the 22 years, or a short, at least while they were there, uh, in making this country uh, go through horrendous 
a horrendous experience, the consequences of which we are still living. Before I bring in Mr. Mboch here, you also talk about how the president uh, nominated uh, one of the, uh, the National Assembly members who was defeated in the Italian Kundan constituency, that's Fatima Jawara. Jawara. But does the law provide anywhere where it says the president cannot nominate uh, somebody who has been defeated in the polls? I mean, it's just that the president can nominate five to the parliament. So does that in any way mean that the president is about is want to perpetuate himself? Well, Mr. Sise, I think you, you are being very formal and legalistic to some degree, and that's fine. I think there are some times when considerations should go beyond the legal and the formal. No. That's my argument. No. Uh, moral considerations, and uh, not looking for what really works for you or what works for your benefit. I think Farnabuda could have served in another capacity outside of the National Assembly. Fabakri yeah. Tombo uh, um could have served in another capacity outside of the speaker seat. And it would still make the decision political, but there would have been some moral considerations, I think. Okay, aside from that, in terms of competence, do you think they have the knowledge, the skills, to really uh, mind the position they are given? I think Judging by their past experience. Well, no, let's put everything aside, yeah, as you said, I mean, yeah. what they have done in the past, um, supporting the former regime. But in terms of knowledge, skills, and competence, do you agree that I think there are more competent people oh. that the president could have, could have appointed. I mean, Gambi has a lot of well-trained, uh, well-equipped legally, or whatever criteria you take, uh, could have filled that position much better without the garbage or without the baggage that comes along with Tombong Jata and CD. Uh, sitting guy. I'm seeing my co-host, see, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mboj is nodding his head. Mr. Mboj, I know you, you, you want to come in here now. Yes, um, um, Professor Sen, <coughs> in one of your pieces, I'm um, responding to the recent elections, you used this rather catchy, quite fascinating term, class coup. Yeah. What, what we are talking about here, are they sort of like symptoms, as it were, of this class coup, mm. as you call it? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> Mr. Mboj. Let's go into this class school. What is the nature of this, this school? I use the term class in a very loose way. Clearly, we don't have time to get into the definition yes, and all that. Of course. Yeah. But really, if you look at the composition of the National Assembly, as well as those who are taking over power, they are relatively new. Uh, for lack of a better word, they are novices for the most part. Mm. Unlettered, not very well educated, and really have their ears on the ground as far as the population is concerned. This is their charm, as I argue. Where are the sophisticated politicians? They've all been so-called bested. Uh, they've been defeated at their own game. So really, what I argue in this piece, Mr. Mboj, is that we should give credit to the Gambian electorate. They are not as naive as we assume them to be. They are probably more in tune philosophically and in terms of pragmatics with this crop of new politicians who speak their language as opposed to the highly educated um, and so forth and so on. Yes, but, but this, this, is, this is sort of like my, my, my worry. I mean, we, we, we think that the standard, the caliber could have been higher, yet when you factor in, you know, the, the, the obvious fact that they were voted into power, yes. what does that tell you about, about the electorate and the nature of politics? In the country. I, I do not quite understand how yes. the electorate, what thought processes sort of, as yes. it were, inform this decision to come and vote for people that quite obviously, as you mentioned during the swearing in, they were struggling, stumbling yes, over the words of yes. the oath. That's a very difficult question, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> <Bush>. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, yes. And really, I have mm -hmm. given a lot of thought into this, mm -hmm. Mr. Sisi, yeah. in terms of why, given the difficult economic conditions we live in, especially for the poor, uh, why they would in turn vote for these for these candidates. My hunch, and I've started really thinking about it and putting some notes on, on paper, 
It is a very complex question in the mm -hmm. sense that it has to do, I believe, with the way in which we are socialized as Gambians. Add to that the religious component. The leader is the leader, what, how, however they come and whatever they may be. And this is supported by the religion as well. And of course, when it comes to elections, there are the economic inducements. So mm -hmm. in some, what I'm saying is, there is the use of sin, sin, and that is in both Christianity and Islam. So sin is used as a means of rallying people to think in a particular way, to vote for the leader, because the leader is God's representative on earth. I mean, that's a little yeah, religious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also the issue of guilt and, gla and blame. And the use of death. Mm -hmm. Oh, feeling mm -hmm. So we just do what we can do to make sure there's stability. Of course, there's the social component uh, which tends to emphasize peace. Peace at the expense of certain key groups and so forth and so on. So really, when you combine all this and the economic inducement and the fact that these young politicians and NAMs have more in common with the common Muhammad and Fatu, they tend to get the vote overwhelmingly. Yeah, absolutely. That's very interesting. Just, just, just one more. Because <laughs> um, Halifa Sala, um, um, recently he, he wrote a piece where he makes a distinction between what he called um, formal democracy and substantive democracy. Yes. And talking about these inducements, as it were, that is sort of Im embedded in the system. Absolutely. So t to him, um, the formal democracy would be like, you, you accept um, the results as announced perhaps by the IEC. It's not formally six of you accept everything you go. Whereas with substantive um, democracy, it, it's about people choosing the right yes. candidate, yes. as it were, that, 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 that sort of thing. Yes. For, for me, this is it. I mean, uh, how I conceptualize it is this. Um, it appears as if democracy is not going to give me the right choices. Mm -hmm. It appears that it's just a, a process. Then I will have processes and outcomes, yes. <laughs> whatever that might be. And it appears to me that given my society what it is, we've talked about um, the education system, how damaged, how everything mm -hmm. collapsed. Given what my society is, well, this is what is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm yes. not sure that we can go beyond the level yes. that we are. Ah, absolutely. And processes, there are processes. And yes. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with Khalifa and you. And you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have written about democracy for, for quite some time. Yes. And I call this the paper democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a facade in some ways. Yes. But nonetheless, that's what we have. That's it. People will vote, however they vote. And at the end of the day, we accept what they have decided, whether we like it or not. That is their choice. If I had the authority or the means, uh, which I did, at least most of you did, I didn't vote. I couldn't vote because I spent too long in the diaspora. Yeah. But anyway, that's it. Um, that's, I guess, what, what the reality is. I think really we have a lot of work to do. Uh, in terms of pol political awareness, education, and, and so forth and so on. Yes, I mean, you talk about the issue of the political aw awareness. I mean, you talk about people perhaps voting, like you said, the economic inducement. I mean, in a sense that we've seen sometimes, I mean, those, those who have been, been elected, like you said, caught on uh, and let out. I mean, who should be blamed in this case? Most of these candidates, they come from political parties. Is it the electorates or the political parties in terms of identifying competent people to represent us at the National Assembly? It's a combination of the two, really. It's not a, it's not a one or the other. Okay. I think it's a combination of the two. Well, look, the caliber, I mean, I say this respectfully. The caliber of the National Assembly has a lot to be desired. Even the executive and, and the other branches of government except maybe for you know, the judiciary. Uh, but for the most part, 
education, and I'm not saying book education necessarily, and experience. I mean, these are crucial uh, for, for a very effective functioning of a democracy. When you don't have those uh, elements in place, it makes it all the more all the more feeble, all the more vulnerable, and open to being abused. So what I'm saying ultimately is uh, the caliber has to be improved. High school education for a president and some experience. What experience are we talking about? And I'm not personalizing this. It's not about Barrow or anybody else. It could have been anybody who doesn't meet the expectation I am talking about. We have to raise the standards at the university, in our high schools, uh, in our personal comportment, in terms of corruption, and a host of other things. There's a lot of work to be done in, in our society. I mean, you talk about the, the legislature. It's far from what many desire. I mean, where does this now leave the parliament looking at its powers, the legislation, the, you know, the, the, the oversight function and the representative aspect of it. Where does it leave the parliament when you have a weak parliament, parliamentarians? Well, I, I think it's going to be a, a learning curve. And I believe it's going to take some time. But I would urge you know, those in power to bring in the workshops, uh, training, in the basic and rudimentary elements of democracy and uh, responsibilities, division of and separation of powers, those political science 101 courses. Uh, and I'm not assuming they don't know it, but it will just make it easier for them to assume their responsibilities in a more, in a more astute way, make those distinctions. In fact, I'm suggesting, and I have called a few of them, if they ever needed my services to advise them on any bill or whatever it may be that they are interested in knowing, there are a slew of returnees, including myself, who can really help them out in making the National Assembly a more effective space, political space. Look, we want this government to succeed. We want this, I emphasize that, we want Barrow and his administration and his cabinet to succeed. Because when they succeed, we all succeed. If they tackle inflation, corruption, insecurity, the cost of living, it is better for us all. So I think Gambians should rally around them and give them the support that they need to make a difference in this country. While at the same time, calling them out, if need be, in areas where they are found lacking. I mean, you, you talk about the issue of tackling corruption, insecurity. I mean, you've done a lot of pieces about the previous government. I mean, what will you point to as some of the opportunities that this government currently has to be able to tackle this uh, menace compared to the, the past regime? I think the cabinet is a good place to begin. I think the appointments have been, have been good for the most part. And I think these are men and women of integrity. Uh, and I think Barrow has learned. I think Barrow has, President Barrow has really uh, come into his role as president. I have been very impressed by his delivery uh, at different places. I was at the graduation yeah. at uh, UTG, at your at Q, Q City. Q City, yes. And I thought his delivery was excellent. I thought his delivery alongside with the VP, uh, Badrajouf, Ali Badrajouf, uh, who was then the Minister of Higher Education. Higher Education. But Ali. Ali, Ali Juf, yes. And I should know that because we, yeah. went, to high <laughs> we went to high school together. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think really they were very, very impressive. So this is where we must begin. There appears to be a commitment uh, in this cabinet that they are going to tackle, or at least try to tackle, the problems. And they understand the problems. And they have a roadmap. I think that's impressive. But again, civil society organizations, the other estate, the media, the media. Uh, have a very crucial role to play in helping them where 
they are needed, but at the same time, uh, raising questions and concerns where they are found wanting. And like you said, I mean, uh, at, the, you know, uh, at the swearing in of the new cabinet, we had the president say, I mean, Gambians are now politically aware yes. and, you know, they are ready to hold the government accountable. Absolutely. What do you make of his statement? What was oh, his tell? Uh, well, I think what, what Barrow, uh, President Barrow was saying there is, look, things have changed. Mm -hmm. Gambians are no longer as naive, as political unaware and docile. They are active participants in the political process. And they're going to challenge us to do the right thing. I thought that was very, very astute of him to say. And I think he's going to hold them to book. He's going to hold them accountable. And in turn, um, Gambians are going to hold them accountable. And I would hope that in time, this is still early in the game, that in time, uh, gender parity would, would, be, would be a non-issue in the cabinet. And hopefully in the National Assembly and future appointments in key positions of government. Are you proposing having laws that will provide for this gender? If need be, yes. Okay. I don't think we should leave it only to the executive. Uh, they exercise considerable power. And that has to do with, of course, the 1997 Constitution, uh, where the separation of powers uh, was kind of uh, gutted in favor of the executive. I think the failed constitution, uh, draft constitution, uh, could have ameliorated some of these. And maybe, and many people believe, that is why it failed, among other things. I mean, before Mr. Bush come in, you're talking about a draft constitution that has failed, that was rejected at the, at the parliament. I mean, in your own opinion, do you think uh, there was a need to go into this whole process of drafting a new constitution, like the 1997 constitution, which we're still using? Was it as bad as many portrayed? I think so. Okay. I really think the 1997 Constitution, if it had not been tampered with, as Jame did, if it had passed in 1996 with term limitations, age limits, and so forth and so on, uh, it would have been okay. But you, you will recall that there was over 50 changes to the Constitution, and all of them were intended to give Yaya Jame a leg up. So really, there are two arguments about this, but I tend to feel or believe that a new constitution would have taken care of this. Well, thank uh, you very uh, much. Uh, that's Professor Abdullah Sen, a new constitution which the president has promised to deliver to Gambia in his second term, but uh, let's wait and find out. We'll go for a short break, and when we return, uh, discussion continues. Looking for the fastest and easiest way to receive money transfers from abroad? Well, Q-Money and RIA just made it happen. Now you can receive international money transfer from RIA directly into your Q-Money account with no additional cost. Once you receive an SMS alert about your transfer, walk into any Q-Money agent across the country to receive your payment for free or use the money immediately to buy credit, QPower and other Q-Money services. It's fast, safe and convenient. For more info, call Customer Care on 133 Q-Money, Sunyu Kalpe. Terms and conditions apply. Hello viewers, welcome back uh, from Dust Hood Break. You reminded you're watching QTV and we're broadcasting from our studios here on Kairaba Avenue in the Gambia, West Africa. My name is Ali Usise and you're watching uh, your weekly State of Affairs program here on QTV, also uh, broadcasted on uh, Q Radio on 103.3. And I have uh, Mr. Mboch in the studio. Our guest this week is Professor Abdullah Sen. Mr. Mboch, I'm seeing you, know, you were nodding your head before you go on the break. You seem to have a lot of questions now for Professor Sen. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm certain thing you mentioned. I just want to sort of tie sort of things together. Um, one thing that struck me, I have to say, um, Professor Sen, was mm -hmm. that when the president made the nominations in the legislature, the National Assembly, people thought, well, some of us were quite wide-eyed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yes. and all the rest of it. And yet, when we got the cabinet, we thought, hmm, that's quite good. One wonders mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what is going on here. Maybe what is the thinking behind what I did in the National Assembly mm -hmm. and now I'm doing um, I'm, I'm with, with the cabinet. Did, did you give it yes. thought to my mind? That was quite curious. One moment it looked as if he was going to reward, as it mm -hmm. were, mm -hmm. the coalition partners and yes. all the rest of it. And suddenly we were wrong footed. <laughs> 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 he took the... <laughs> No, I think that's a very interesting observation. 
I think President Barrow listened. The outpour of emotion over the nominations of Tombang Jata and, and, and Sidin Jai, it really sent a very strong lesson, or a message at least, that he took into consideration in the appointments of the cabinet. I think he, he, he was trying to, in my view, without really knowing the thinking behind it, but these are just assumptions. My thinking is he is trying to rectify what may have appeared a mistake following the outpour of emotion, um, especially after those, those nominations. Absolutely, quite, quite um, I'm curious. And, and you mentioned something else. Um, president, high school, should there be an educational qualification and where do we peg it? For public office, you know, this is sort of like a yes. long-running yeah. argument, even from independence period. Yeah. Should we have this or not? But of course, I mean, universal suffrage. I mean, it's so difficult. Yes. Just allowing everybody, it's so difficult to yes. argue against. But but wh wh what do you think? Well, I I, I believe, I mean, <laughs> as a professor, former professor, yes. I'm still a professor <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at minimum, a BA. At minimum. What does the BA do for you? It gives you the ability, or at least gives you the, the, provides you the ability to think critically, to be able to weigh information, make certain key decisions. It enables you to speak logically and make some good arguments. And you know, it also helps you be a good writer, among other things. At minimum, <laughs> yes, you have to have a BA. But that's quite interesting yeah. because I once, I once read, read a study. They were trying to um, figure out, as it, quantify, as it were, um, a correlation between IQ and good leadership. Mm -hmm. There appears that there isn't that much of a correlation. Mm -hmm. um, good leadership, well, I could have certain characteristics. I may not be educated, but I might be able to ask the right question. Yes. That, 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 yes. that sort of thing. Yes. So, so people like me, I'm a bit of a skeptic mm -hmm. <laughs> about this relationship yes. between yes. IQ and leadership. Absolutely. Well, what, what, Absolutely. Do you, what do you think about well, it? I don't uh, think there's <laughs> even a good correlation yeah. between yeah. education yeah. Yeah. and IQ. Yeah. So, uh, so what, the argument that at least a BA, yeah. well, how do you? No, I think <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> I, 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 may be, uh, I may be called out as being elitist. <laughs> But I do believe... You, you mentioned it. Yes. I, 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 do, <laughs> I do believe that when, when you're exposed to a university environment, you are availed the opportunity to weigh information and be exposed to a perspective, a variety of different, even sometimes conflicting perspectives. And uh, it enables you then to weigh the information and then make your own choices or decision. I think it's, it's a requirement, but it's not a sufficient condition. Okay. I think what you're alluding to, Mr. Mboj, is social intelligence. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I think social intelligence is, is probably as important, if not more important, than a paper qualification. But really, university education um, provides you, it opens you up. It, it, really, it really has the tendency or the possibility of challenging your own prejudices and pushing you in directions that are possibly uh, unimaginable. And I think really um, our administrators, our, our NAMs, um, and people in key positions of power ought to be exposed to some degree of, of education. And that's even the more reason that we should spend more money at UTG and the other institutions, tertiary institutions, so that we can have quality uh, graduates. I have been very impressed, though, with many of the graduates I've met. MOJ had a national discussion over the TRRC recommendations, 
of which I was a part, amongst many others. And I was privileged to chair or facilitate the workshop on institutional reforms. And I was very impressed by, by the caliber. I taught a graduate seminar on political economy at UTG. And really, I am still very impressed. So really, that's potential. I am hopeful, in other words, uh, when it comes to the future of this country. Uh, absolutely. Just, just, just one more. Um, the opposition, hugely, <laughs> given our, our, our political system, the yes. opposition is hugely important here. But what do we have in our National Assembly? Is it 18, the ruling 18, party? 18, NPP, 15, UDP, UDP 4, and NRP, 4 and 2 APRC, 2 yes. PDIS, and how, how do you see that sort of the, the, the balance of power, how <laughs> things are in, in, in there, yes. given that we need a credible opposition Absolutely. really doing their work, you know, yes, holding diligently. the government's feet in the fire, yes, as yes. Were, that's, that's sort of the that's what How would, do you see that? that, that yeah. That's what I would want to see. Mm. I think most Gambians would like to see a vibrant, well-informed, uh, opposition that would not be a rubber stamp. What I find disturbing is I have seen some independents or heard some independents already crossing the carpet and that doesn't bode well for the future. I am hoping and praying as most Gambians are that each individual NAM I'm sure will take their oath seriously and would be there to represent their constituencies. And in so doing, would have at the core of their arguments and what they do, activity, to really look out for the Gambian population. And really to, to put aside, at least sometimes, or most of the time, partisan and individual interests. This is a very tall order, certainly. But it is something that's not going to be achieved overnight, but over time. And I think if we are able to engender that level of seriousness, commitment, patriotism amongst the NAMs and throughout the country, I think we would make some headways in the National Assembly where we can have good debates um, challenging the executive and whoever else might come in and um, make a headway in, in really navigating the ship into the right direction. Because really we are at a, at a crossroads. We don't have too many chances left. This might be perhaps our last chance to make it. Because really the way the country has been going for the last 20, 26, 27 years, uh, some might even say before that, uh, has not been in the right direction. And we need to take, we need to take a, a clearly charted path uh, to navigate this country in the right direction. And I think it's going to take all Gambians, the opposition, the government in place, the media, CSOs, to, to come to that. That's it. I mean, you talk about the issue of uh, patriotism here. Uh, should it be top bottom approach or bottom top approach? I mean, you talk to some people, you talk about why not we introduce, I mean, civic education in our curriculum in schools yeah. to build this, uh, this thing in the, in the minds of the young ones. Mm -hmm. What's your take? I you, think it's going to take. Do you agree with that? You see, it, as, I've, as I've often, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, they are not antagonistic. Okay. It's not, um, it's a dialectic. Okay. Um, they feed into one another. So what I'm saying is, yes, it's important for government to take the initiative uh, in terms of civic education. But CSOs also have a vital role to play, uh, especially CSOs, uh, a very vital role. We need, as we were talking about in this MOJ um, national discussion, a culture of human rights where we respect people for who they are because they are fundamentally human. We need to have embedded in our policies a gender parity equation where nothing would pass without consideration of gender, uh, religious minorities, and, and so forth and so on. 
Look, anybody who has grown up in Gambia uh, is keenly aware of the disparities regionally, in terms of religion, in terms of gender, um, differently abled, and so forth and so on. And I think we need to make a concerted effort to bring all this on it onto the table uh, to make decisions that would benefit all of us. Yeah, well, absolutely. But, but for me, um, um, Professor Sen, the, the, the problem I have is um, how, how do I conceptualize things? Um, what is the political landscape like? What are, what are the fault lines? Mm -hmm. I cannot use left or right, that kind yes. of left right <laughs> politics that I see <laughs> over there. It's not relevant here. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the sort of, I'm not sure whether I, it's fair to ask this question, but do we have any such thing as sort of the primary qualities of sort of um, 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 identity, th that kind of primary yes. identity, political identity that is easy to ever <laughs> slot into this, into that. How do I explain what yes. is going on? Right now. Right now. What concepts do I have? The conceptual tools. Another difficult question. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the political landscape as mm -hmm. it stands yeah. today mm -hmm. is messy. Yeah. It is fluid. We have maybe two major poles, the executive dominating almost everything. You have the National Assembly that is kind of embryonic in its formation, kind of weak, but has potential. Uh, the judiciary, on the other hand, I believe is very strong. So it's a question of really helping to mature these institutions so that there can be a true separation of powers, so that power is not located in any single space. But as of now, it is very fluid with a dominant and a very powerful executive. And that's typical in most African countries. And such a system is predicated on patronage. Um, but we are hoping that we shall transition away from that. That's it. It's always how do we break the cycle? Yeah, it's very <laughs> unstable. It's very <laughs> unstable as we speak. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was going to bring me really to, to the other point. I mean, it matters because we talk about development, development, Devel development. Yes, yes. But that is really <laughs> where it takes place, depending on what you do there. Yes. Then you can see development. Absolutely. So it's absolutely important, no wonder that perhaps all over the continent, we are not seeing the development that we should see, that we want, that we seek, no, I, uh, because the politics is not right. Absolutely. Can I make that? Uh, I, th I think you make the point very well. Look, the way I see things working in Gambia, we aspire to be part of the global community, ascribing or subscribing to best practices and standards. But we fall very short. We talk the talk, but at the end of the day, again, we don't walk the walk. I mean, we have all the great policy instruments in place. But execution is always a problem. Attitude. I mean, I learned a lot, certainly, from, from the national discussion we had yesterday. So it is like there is a variance between the ideals and the reality. And the closer we can bring them together, Mr. Burge, I think so much the better. How do we do that? It's going to be difficult. Sensitization, education, uh, a culture of human rights, really. Participation and, and tolerance. We are not a very tolerant people. Um, we don't like difference. We like conformity. And I think for a democracy to thrive, all ideas ought to be entertained. All perspectives, even modalities of execution, execution of policy. I think policy ought to be problematized. Pro I mean, I think policy ought to be something we, we, we converge on and talk about and discuss, and then come to some resolution. Gambians don't want that. They like to follow the, the so-called convenient way. And some of these things are messy, Mr. Mr. Mboj and Mrs. Sisi. The whole process of development 
is deeply political and politicized. And we need really not only economists, you need political economists, anthropologists, gender specialists, you name it, media people, you name it, uh, to come to terms with the national development um, program, the national development plan as it is. I mean, it's promising, but as I have written about it, 2020, Vision 2020, and, and all these uh, plans, they are fraught with a lot of difficulties. I mean, you talk about I mean, the National Development Plan. Earlier, you, you were talking about the issue of attitudes. I mean, even if, if you go into the civil service, people's mm -hmm. attitudes towards work and all those things. I mean, if you were to give an advice to the government in terms of ensuring we, we have the proper restructuring to ensure people's attitudes towards mm -hmm. work change, what would it be? Well, you know, there are, there's a new minister for that. So he's watching, and then give some of your ideas will, will, will really be helpful. <laughs> well, reform is always difficult. Mm. But I think there needs to be reorientation of those attitudes. It, and those attitudes are difficult to get rid of. But really, we need to have consequences, among other things. People need to be at work at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, whatever time is prescribed. People that kind of ha don't have to have breakfast at home, um, at, at work. <laughs> yeah. I had volunteered at some offices uh, a couple of years ago. And before things begin, it's about two, even two and a half hours into the work day <laughs> before work begins in earnest. Breakfast here, people are going to do d different things. So what I'm suggesting is there needs to be there needs to be really some reorientation of the values and the ethos of work, the work ethic. The work ethic is poor, to say mm -hmm. the least. Mm -hmm. And it will take training, um, workshops, inducements, punishments. If you are work, if you are late for work, <laughs> uh, your salary is going to be deducted. There are going to be consequences for not delivering. If you leave because you have to go to a wedding or to a funeral, uh, some of those, cons those things can be, can be understood and can be negotiated. But you have to make up the time. Um, it's going to take um, internal uh, reworkings of the structure itself. But attitudinally, I think it's more important. Once the attitudes change, I think the structures can be readjusted. Uh, to complement those changes. I mean, Isn't you talk about the just just one minute. Optimism. Optimism. Following up to this, yeah. very 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 interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm there. Yeah. Um, um, when you were saying that you know the talk and the walk, people really cannot walk the talk. I'm, I'm like, well, they're spending so much time talking, they never learn to walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> now, I'm quite quite fascinating here, um, especially when you mentioned anthropology. Yeah. I, I once listened to a fascinating lecture. A University of London lecture delivered by this an yeah. anthropologist mm. who had gone on to, to Kenya, around Africa, and, and just looking at this term, this concept we call development. development. Mm -hmm. she, she had some very curious ideas. I said, hey, look, <coughs> I went over there. There were some investments. Technology was brought in, as, as it were. But the people, you see, they wanted the people to have farming throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, she realized that actually, People had organized their lives around the seasons. Mm -hmm. When they call it, you know, um, 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 not farming season, they are tied up doing mm -hmm. other things in mm -hmm. the society, in mm -hmm. the community. So all of these technology investment, all of that money, maybe something else that we are not looking into is that social innovation. And this will encapsulate, as it were, the, the attitudes and, and all the rest of it. Without that social innovation, you see, when I look at some of the, our CSOs and our NGOs, there's so much, so much emphasis on my rights, my rights, my rights. Not so much on my responsibilities, yes, my yes. responsibilities, my responsibilities. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I'm not sure you how to take this. Yes. So we keep saying, oh, government, oh, we need these policies, that policies. But when I look at the society, mm -hmm. I'm worried where I should begin. I'm not sure if we are.
mm. beginning from there. What, 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 do, what do you think? Oh, no, no, I think it was just <laughs> it will take extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> it, it will take some time for us to mm. to figure out. Yeah. I mean that complexity, but yeah. ultimately development, however defined, and I've taught development studies for a number of years. Mm. It is a term that is fraught with a lot of issues, ideological, racial, uh, hegemonic, power relationships, and we don't have time to get into that. Yeah. But the process has to, be, has to be organic. It has to be owned. It has to be driven by those who, who are being developed. <laughs> uh, and that again is another issue that you know. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't like that. So <laughs> empowerment, enlightenment are terms I like better. Because developing to where, and for whom, and for what, for whose, whose, whose purposes. Um, it has to be indigenous, it has to be driven by the people, it has to be community-based. Uh, yes, it's good to have you know, the big plans, national plans, at the macro level, but ultimately it is people that we're talking about. And if we can give the wherewithal for individuals to do activities that are going to benefit them in the end, I think that's more important than, than really trying to subscribe to this neoliberal, mm. this neoliberal sensibilities, the IMF and the World Bank, good work as they have done. Uh, really, I'm not sure if they understand what it is that Gambians want. Yeah, and if and they there's do, the rub. Yes. There's so much into what we do. Some people even express the idea that perhaps our economic policies, everything being framed really by the IMF, World yeah, Bank, yeah. and all the rest of it. Extraordinary. I'm, How I'm do we I'm, is the escape hatch? <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable with that. So that when we come to the National Development Plan, I certainly have a lot of questions, a lot of reservations. Really, if, if I were part, and that's why you need anthropologists. You need political scientists, you need gender, all these people come together yes. to debate the issue. It shouldn't be received information. Mm -hmm. It should be something we contest, something we interrogate, and hatch out something that would work for, for Gambia specifically. We have the talent. We have a lot of Rochinese. We have a lot of young, bright Gambians who can sit at the table and craft something and not really throwing out the baby with the bathwater, mm -hmm. but appropriating things from the neoliberal uh, to several purposes. I don't think, look, I don't want to get too ideological, <laughs> <laughs> but I have right, problems yeah. with this neoliberal framework that's being foisted on Gambia. Uh, it hasn't worked, and I don't believe it's going to work with even the best of intentions. The, the conversation is, is quite very interesting, <laughs> but I'm afraid I mean, we have come to the end of the uh, program. Professor Sen, thank you so much for coming on the State of Affairs. We thank quite you, Alu. appreciate your insight, uh, and thank you so much for coming. I have really enjoyed this conversation, Mr. Boyd and Alu, <laughs> and I hope I come back again soon. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, we, 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 we'll have you here again. Uh, well, viewers, uh, thank you so much for watching uh, the program. This is uh, State of Affairs. It's aired every Tuesday at 9 p.m. and repeated uh, on Sunday at 10 a.m. Our guest this week uh, was uh, Professor Abdullah Sen, and with me in the studio was my co-host and contributor, uh, Modum Bosch. Do join us next week. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>